With something like 5 million podcasts, finding a really good one can take a ton of time. So let me recommend one. It's called Something You Should Know. I'm the host, Mike Carruthers, and in each episode, we discuss topics that can be really helpful, like how to read people better, the psychology of crowds, or fun things like the story of Legos, or why you probably wouldn't be here if it weren't for horses. Something You Should Know is the name of it, wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, I'm Jennifer, a co-founder of the Go Kid Go Network. At Go Kid Go, putting kids first is at the heart of every show that we produce. That's why we're so excited to introduce a brand new show to our network called The Search for the Silver Lining, a fantasy adventure series about a spirited young girl named Isla who time travels to the mythical land of Camelot. During her journey, Isla meets new friends, including King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table, and learns valuable life lessons with every quest, sword fight, and dragon ride. Positive and uplifting stories remind us all about the importance of kindness, friendship, honesty, and positivity. Join me and an all-star cast of actors, including Liam Neeson, Emily Blunt, Kristen Bell, Chris Hemsworth, among many others, in welcoming the Search for the Silver Lining podcast to the Go Kid Go Network by listening today. Look for the Search for the Silver Lining on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe on iTunes at Toddcast Podcast. Ah, there he is. Hey, buddy. Going on, bud? How are you doing? Good, man. Thank you for taking some time. We have Dave Scatchard on the program now. Uh, and geez, I guess after reading some of the book last night, the comeback, my journey through heaven and hell, we're lucky that you're even around today. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a crazy story, and I was scared to show it. <laughs> I was scared to tell it, um, but uh, that's what happened, and that's why I'm doing the stuff I'm doing now. Yeah, and so. Like, what was the process of finally saying, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to write this down. Like, uh, well, uh, at first I was just trying to, to be able to function in society and live a normal life. I wasn't even thinking about how I was going to write a book. I just was trying to like survive. And then after a few years of, of healing and some miracles and things like that, that I share in the book, um, I was finally able to uh, to get my head around it. I tried to write a few chapters and I just had notes everywhere and I had like so many stories and I ended up, uh, I had a friend who wrote a bestseller and I said, man, I said, I'm having trouble finishing this thing. Like, what, what do you suggest? And he goes, well, you know, I hired this company to help me organize it all and create my cover for me and all that. Um, and he goes, I think they'd help you. So when I went to the pros and I and I hired a, a solid company to help me get it across the finish line, um, it was just kind of nice because, you know, that's all they do every single day. So um, yeah. it was nice for them to help me sort through all the stories and figure out which ones were going to go in and which ones weren't. Like, it's not like I was writing about like last year or two. Like I was, I was trying to capture... <laughs> 45 years of my life with your in, life yeah 200 and 260 pages or something like that so it's kind of hard to like go that quick through somebody's entire life but um they did a good job of editing it down and cutting it down for me so i'm happy about that and you know no offense of course but you're a you're a hockey player you're not you're not an author so i am now i am now know, well, you are now of course you are now <laughs> you can't take it away from me now <laughs> yes uh, but so that, like, what, what was the steps then I, was it just initially like okay i, I need to think of some stories no like, which I ones just, make the book like was it hard to decide which ones didn't make the book oh yeah no there's like time like i could write like five books like and now that i've done it and now i know how how to do it um i could i'm gonna write more um you are yeah yeah i got i got a lot of personal development stuff that i've kind of discovered on my own through my coaching programs and crazy stories where we save people's lives and like um i've had these epiphanies and these breakthroughs in my own life and i've been able to coach on it and you know we we touched on a little pieces of that in the book but we didn't really um unpack all of that and you know uh shoot i did I did uh, 
30 interviews with NHL players that nobody's got to see yet. I was trying, I was trying to sell it to Netflix and uh, mm. they're really cool. They're all behind the scenes stuff. And you had guys like Jovo and um, Nash and Tyson Nash and uh, Niedermeyer and um, Gary Roberts and all these cool guys. we got like 30 guys. They're, they're more old school guys. And I filmed it over the last decade and I ha- it's kind of like the book. Like I haven't got it across the finish line. It's just been sitting here waiting. And I finally got a hold of somebody that does sell stuff to Netflix. And they said, um, Dave, this is incredible what you've done, but uh, we, it's kind of too nice and too positive. Like we're looking for like Tiger King and you're looking <laughs> and yours is all like, you know, positivity and happiness. <laughs> so like there's nothing controversial about it. So um, the guy that, that shared that with me had won some Emmys and um, he said, Dave, what I would really suggest that you do is um, create a, create one of your coaching packages around it. So then I started thinking, I'm like, what if I took all those interviews and, all the amazing stories and information there during those interviews and made a book about it. So I think what we're going to do is take those interviews and break them down and create a book based on those 30 hours of interviews I've done and all the credible, incredible stories from all these superstars on how they made it to the NHL. So nobody knows about that. I've never mentioned that publicly. So you're the first person I've told about that, but um, that's probably going to be, the fastest next book is to it's already done. Like all the information's there, all the great stories are there. So now it'll just be kind of organizing it again. So that's cool. Right. Well, at least now, you know, you know, the steps uh, that it takes, right? <laughs> yeah, so, man, we're bestseller. Now you can't take that away from me ever again. Amazon that's amazing. Bestseller. I know it's uh, we, we were lucky. We had, we had a, almost all three. So uh, on Amazon, we had our Kindle book at one. We had our paperback at two. And like, it was funny because like Gretzky and Messier are down like eight, nine. <laughs> like I'm like, that's the first time I'll ever, and only time I'll ever be ahead of those guys in anything. So the fact that we had our book ahead there when we launched, and we had a lot of momentum leading up to the launch. So that was nice. And and then once, once we grabbed that bestseller um, status, then, you know, it doesn't really you try to stay on the list as long as you can. And right. we're still, we're still on there, but um, every review helps every, like I'm learning all these things, like every review helps every type of sale. So like I'm finishing the audiobook right now. And when you sell an audiobook, it actually counts as a book sold, you know, the ebook counts as a book sold, the paperback counts and they're all priced differently and stuff like that. But each one counts as a book. So uh, yeah, I'm, 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 probably going to be able to actually you're in Canada, right? So I was going to say, I was going to try to give you guys a free plus shipping offer to Canada for the book, but it's so expensive to ship from here. I think it's probably cheaper for everyone to get it from Amazon. Mm. And I'll, I'll include a link with you for that yeah, as yeah. well, as well for all your listeners. Like before I forget, I'd love to um, offer you guys a chance to come down and see what we do live. We're having a, a big event in December, December 3rd, 4th and 5th in Scottsdale. And uh, there'll actually be quite a few NHL guys speaking with me, but um, it's my event. It's for my all-star coaching program. Um, and we should have a few hundred people in there mm. and uh, I'm hiring some really world-class coaches and speakers to come in and present for three days. So it's going to be me, a uh, bunch of coaches and trainers, some personal development stuff, and then um, then a bunch of my hockey buddies. And maybe I'm going to reach out to Charles Barkley this week and see if Charles will come speak for us. And oh, nice. I'm literally looking down here, and I've got Herschel, Walker's, uh, Herschel Walker, the football player's card that just popped out of my desk for no reason. So I don't know if I'm supposed to call him and ask him <laughs> if he'll come speak or what. But I think you should. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So start to finish, how long did it take to write the comeback? Uh, five years of from me starting and then about a year and a half after I hired the company to help me uh, polish it off and get it out there. Wow. Yeah. It's a long process. Eh? And lots of really nice yeah. things, uh, you know, with Ronick and Oland and Potter and Trottier. Huh. And yeah, guys, yeah. These guys love you. I'm, I'm, I'm very honored. Uh, you know, um, 
the crazy thing is like, you don't really realize how, how valuable your friendships are until like you need something. <laughs> and uh, JR has been nothing but super supportive of me and my coaching brand. And I did some, I, I helped him through some stuff with some coaching that I did with him and then he's just been a huge supporter of mine. And uh, he's been on a bunch of my free challenges that I do. We helped over 17,000 people last year. And I think with four challenges and JR was on probably two of them, I think. And he just volunteered his time and came on and told people inspirational stories and, and about his, you know, some things personally that he was going through. And, um, you know, whenever it was funny, I, I was wanting to do this live event during COVID and I couldn't because of, uh, I mean, everything was shut down. So I had all these people that I promised a live event to when they bought my stuff and I couldn't give it to them. So as a gift, I, I gathered together an online summit and I had uh, Jeremy Roenick, Reed Lowe, Darcy Hordachuk were three of my guys. And then I brought in some of my successful clients and then I call these cool people. And I literally put it together in like, and Shane Doan came on, you know, I put it together in like a week. And all my, all my coaching friends and peers are like, Dave, how do you put a summit on in like five, <laughs> five days? Like it takes us like months to set it up. And we got to organize all the speakers. And, we, and I'm like, I didn't pay one person. Like they all just volunteered. And they're like, what? Like, how do you do that? And I didn't, I didn't even sell anything at the end of it. I just wanted to like bless my group and let them hear from like people that are doing amazing stuff. And, and that's what I learned this last year is like all my challenges were free. So that's how we helped 17,000 people. And yes, a bunch of them became clients or customers and they bought different things, but that wasn't the purpose of it. It was really to show up and help people during COVID. And like, I was literally sitting in my backyard. I had this successful one-on-one -on -one coaching practice, but I'd never really done groups. And I was, you know, um, I'm running a, a very solid company. And then I, I like felt this, voice or this presence say like what about everyone else like are you gonna help them and i'm like what do you mean like <laughs> what am i supposed to do and the message back to me was like do what you're doing with your one-on-one -on -one clients and just do it for the masses and do it for free and i was like okay how do i do that it's like just so i started to create a program that day i joined this coaching program that actually had a challenge for us to launch a youtube channel a webinar uh, all these like things. And the, the, the hardest one was a challenge. And normally people would do a three day or a five day, like the first time they're out of the gate, I chose a seven day challenge and I was creating slides like five minutes before I'm going live and I wasn't <laughs> sleeping. And I'm like, how do I run Facebook ads? So I didn't know how to do any of that. And like, I'd been studying this stuff, but I hadn't really like implemented it the way that I did. And I mean, shoot, we weren't even trying to sell anything. And we, we made uh we, we made 10 X our, our investment in the Facebook ads the first time. And then eight or nine X the second time and like six X the third time. And what was cool was there were people in the challenges that I knew would never buy my products or my stuff, but like, it didn't matter. I was showing up and I was delivering the things that I had to travel around the world to learn. And as you read in the book, like I was in India, I was in Brazil, I work with a grandmaster from China I, I paid Tony Robbins a fortune. I've, I've invested about 800 grand of my own money to go and learn from all these gurus and these like healers and these energy people. So then to be able to give that back to people for free and to really have them be excited about what we were doing and have a bunch of them come on board with us as clients, it's been life-changing. And uh, we had people... <laughs> Can I swear on this podcast a little yeah, bit or no? Okay. Sure. Okay. So the first challenge we did, uh, cause I was asking, I like, I'm getting this message to do this challenge. I'm like, I don't know what to call it. And then I started thinking about it. And with all my one-on-one -on -one clients, I'd say like, Hey, why did you hire me? You could have hired anybody. And I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm not cheap and I, but I do deliver the numbers and the goods. And they're like, well, Dave, I just had to get my shit together. And I knew that you could help me get my shit together. And I had like four or five clients tell me almost the exact same phrase. And mm -hmm. I was like, that's weird. So then I said, well, why don't I call my 
first challenge to get your shit together challenge. <laughs> so here's the good thing, Todd. And here's the bad thing about that is the good thing is lots of people need to get their shit together. The bad thing is they're not all my so-called ideal clients, right? Which are business owners, entrepreneurs and athletes and like people that are really trying to up level. A lot of them were just trying to like survive. We had multiple, multiple, multiple emails that came into us saying that we, we saved somebody's life and that they wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that challenge. And I'm getting a little bit emotional, but it's like, now that I've got this second kick at the can, right? Like after the near death experience and I'm back here, like I'm finally doing what I'm really put here to do. And that's to, to help people and to have an impact in the world. And, um, it was amazing. And I'm really proud because we didn't stop at one. We just kept going. We did four of them. Uh, I literally just got off the phone with my Facebook guy, my ads guy. And I said, Hey, I want to do another one in November. Like, do we have time? Can we ramp this thing up in three weeks or four weeks and get it out before my live event? And uh, so <laughs> that was the phone call that I was on right before I jumped on this podcast and we're jumping back on 1130. I think I'm going to try to squeeze a, a fifth one in this year. Wow. And, and my goal for next year is really to impact a hundred thousand lives with, with that challenge. And uh, you know, it's going to take, it's going to take about a million dollar investment for me to uh, target, you know, a hundred thousand people to, to join our challenge and run through the challenge. But um, you know, that's, that's my mission, man. It's like, it's, I'm not, I'm not going to not do it. It's, it's, it's what I have to do. So this will be a part of my life for as long as I live. And I'll have my high famous clients and I'll have all these people paying all, all this money, but it's like, you know, these are my, these are my peeps. These are, uh, cause you know, I, I relate so much because if you read the book, like I went through such a dark time and there was nobody that I could turn to. And I, I was embarrassed. I didn't want to, to have people see me broken and damaged after the injuries and me like having difficulty walking and difficulty speaking and, out of shape and fat and like in pain every day, I, I was embarrassed. So I just went into hiding. And um, if there was a challenge like this, that I could have jumped on board anonymously and just like watched and like help me get my head on straight and try to figure out what the heck was going on. I would have been grateful for it. So, so that's, that's, that's who I am. That's what I'm about now. It's my whole life. Um, I've had to hire three coaches now because we're growing so quickly. And, um, you know, I can't keep up this pace. Just Dave Scatcher doing this. I got a whole team of people that I'm bringing on board to help me. So, mm -hmm. yeah, man. Dude, a super inspirational story. Um, I, I want to talk about, you know, growing up in, born in Hinton, but growing up in small town, Salmon Arm, BC. Um, you know, in the book, you're talking about, you know, you're four years old, five years old, you're ready to play some hockey, you're skating, like literally driving trucks onto the ice with your folks and your friends yeah. and all that shit. I think yeah. that's a super cool story. So maybe just kind of, you know, talk about your first uh, memories of hockey and, uh, you know, obviously before you get into the NHL and all that. Yeah, it's a crazy story because like my dad didn't really play any high level and he didn't really even start to play hockey until he was like, he just played for fun at, at University of Calgary yeah. uh, on some, like, I don't know what they call it, like house league team for adults. I guess. Like beer league. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's where he started. But my dad is an amazing teacher and he's, he got his degree in teaching. Uh, he's a physical education teacher. So it was in his like DNA and he always helped people like learn. He, he taught thousands of kids across Canada how to water ski. He just seemed to be like this guy that's meant to teach. And maybe that's where I get this love of, of helping people from my dad. And I talk a little bit about that in the book and he's, he's gone now. He's in heaven, but um, you know, he was the greatest mentor I could have had as a young man. And he believed in me and um, how hockey got introduced was literally we had these somewhat, you know, shallow ponds i guess because they were frozen all the way through so it's just like one block of ice and i yeah I they're like you know we could even start a campfire and they were literally ha crazy. having a campfire on the freaking ice yeah that's how thick <laughs> the ice was and there was no fear of anybody falling in 
and they drive the truck out onto the pond and then the adults would usually just shovel off like a square uh rink and uh if there were a few people the rink would be small if there were like 20 people like nobody sits out like everybody's playing so they just make the rink bigger and bigger and sometimes the wind would blow all the snow off so it'd just be like this clean sheet the whole pond you could skate the whole pond and it was amazing and they would just drop us out there they have some beers on the tailgate of the truck and uh the moms would be in the in the lawn chairs or they'd have their little figure skates on and there'd just be like a bunch of kids just ripping around out there and like falling and no helmets like no helmets protected. <laughs> that's probably why i got the concussion problems but uh you know we'd stumble around until we figured it out and nobody was really teaching it was just like you're just playing and having fun and i think that's the best way to learn so very quickly, I fell in love with it, and having the Oilers uh, as as a team to watch in the early '80s was like so good because you just saw how hard they played and how what a bunch of winners they were, and these crazy young kids that just played so hard. So I modeled a lot of those guys, and um, you know we had uh, guys like Mark Messier and Wayne Gretzky and Grant Fuhr and Marty McSorley, like all these guys are like my buds now. It's like, who would have thought that little Davy Sketcher from Hinton would be like, Gretzky was my coach and fear was the goalie coach and Marty McSorley. I fought in the NHL. And then like, we end up like meeting at the golf tournament here that every year. And like, now we're buddies and it's like Mark Messier was my captain in Vancouver. And like, it's crazy to think like that, that all that stuff like came true that I was like dreaming about and visualizing my whole life. So, you know, it's just sort of natural for me to progress into this other place where now I help other people realize their dreams. Cause like I got to live like all of mine. And then that's the crazy thing is that like 35 years old, you're done for me. Doctors told me I couldn't go back and play. And then my body is just broken and I'm bleeding in my brain and stuff. Um, like then who, who are you? Like, what am I? I'm not a hockey player anymore. Like that's all I've ever done. I, I, I used to have a really clear, precise, almost photographic memory where I could like recall images and pictures and textbooks. And I, school is easy for me. Uh, I got ahead a couple grades, but when all that's gone, my, I had no memory. I was on Alzheimer's medication. Like I was just a mess. Wow. Like, and then like, <laughs> it's kind of hard to feel good about yourself when like nothing works. Yeah. Wow. So anyways. Yeah. And then, and then uh, uh, I loved in the, in the, in the book where you're talking about, you know, realizing like, Hey, maybe I can go all the way. Like you're 10 years old. Well, what was it at, at that at that age that you were like, okay, I, I can, I can make it to the NHL. Uh, I never thought that I would not make it like really, it, it's so weird. Like my dad made me read a book called many are called and few are signed. And it was by this goalie. And it just, this is an old book. Like I was probably 10 years old when I read the book, but it was such a good move by my dad because it kind of told me the reality of my chances of making it to the NHL. Like it's really, really, really almost impossible. Yeah. But my dad would ask me these cool questions. Like I'd, I'd be like, dad, that'd be so amazing if I could play. And he's like, well, what do you think you'd have to do to get there? And like, he'd make me go in my brain and like draw out a roadmap on what it was going to take. So I was like, well, I'm definitely not strong enough. I'm definitely not big enough. My shot's not hard enough. I don't skate fast enough. I have to be quicker, faster, stronger. Da, 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 da. And he goes, okay, cool. So what's, thing you, what's one thing you could do today that would like help you have a better chance, like improve on some of that stuff. And I'm like, well, I'm young. I don't really have weight equipment, but I could run. I could exercise. I could shoot pucks in the backyard. And then I started this routine where I'd shoot hundred pucks a day in my backyard, like my whole freaking childhood, like, like literally, I don't know how many thousands of pucks I had to have shot, but there were days where I'd stay out there for like three or four hours to shoot. I had blisters on my hands. Like I didn't care. And I was like, just, it was like, <laughs> I told my wife the other day, like, <clears throat> 
I think most pro athletes have a little bit of obsessive compulsive behavior or something because they will do things beyond what a rational, normal person would do and like still do it. Like, like, again, I, I think I even put this in the book. I said something like, <clears throat> if I was out shooting pox and my mom and dad called me in for dinner, like I wouldn't just drop my stick and go in. I'd say, I can't go in until I shoot like 10 off the crossbar and down and in the net and they have to be in order. <laughs> and if I miss one, then I got to start all over again at zero. And like you do that enough times, your shots can be pretty damn accurate. And as a kid, like, you know, I was pretty fast, but I didn't really have dangles, but I had a great shot. And that shot carried me through all the way into the NHL when I ended up scoring 27 goals one year and led the others in goals. Um, if it wasn't for that shot, I don't think, uh, and, and a lot of my teammates all knew it. And I was always in the top, like fairly high percentage of shooting percentage in the league. But because I never played 20 minutes a night or wasn't really playing on the first or second line very much, like it kind of went under the radar. People didn't really realize, but my teammates and the goalies that I played with always knew like how accurate my shot was. So yeah, that was, I would just continue to play these games with my, <laughs> play these games with myself and my psychology. Uh, and that was how my confidence started to grow. And then you're right. At 12 years old, I, I ended up going to main camp with St. Albert Saints. Uh, and I'm playing against 16 to 20 year old kids. And they're all huge and hairy and like grown up men. And I actually like somehow pulled it off and played pretty damn good. And that was sort of when all the scouts started like buzzing about who's this kid? Like, what's he doing? And that was kind of the first time where I'm like, okay, I just played against like, you know, kids that were drafted to the NHL and like kids that are like superstars. And like, I was on the same ice as them at 12 and I didn't get, I didn't get killed. And I scored a few goals and like, I'm like, Holy smokes. Like, not that I could, well, I might've been able to play in that league at 12. I mean, I think over the course of the season, I, I, I would have been really hard because I was so little, but um, my skill level was almost there at 12 where I can play with these junior players and stuff. And I'm like, okay, maybe I got a shot at this thing. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Canucks, Islanders, Bruins, Coyotes, Predators, Blues. Uh, I would love to think that the, your time in Vancouver, obviously being a Vancouver podcast is probably the best part of the NHL, but realistically it's gotta be the Islanders got some playoff, you know, games, you got some playoff points. Yeah. Vancouver was unbelievable. Like, it was so cool. And my buddies would all leave Salmon Arm because they were about 20 years old and I was 20 and they went to UBC. So they're all at University of British Columbia. So yeah. as I'm entering the NHL, they're in their second year or third year of university. So they're all there. So when I'm in the show, I'm getting tickets, like ticket requests for like 10 guys that are my kids I grew up with. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, it was amazing because I, I I had so much support around me. My mom and dad would drive down um, from Salmon Arm and watch as many games as they could. Uh, the locals like loved me because I was like just as like I was probably one of the lowest paid guys in the NHL my first year, and I didn't care. I thought I was like the richest guy in the world. I'd go up to what was it called? I think it was called the Pit up at UBC. Oh yeah, at, pub, this, yeah. This pub. And they'd have like 25 cent shot nights, you know, and, and jello shots or something. And I'd buy all my buddies and like half the bar shots. And it cost like $10. <laughs> like, nice. You know what I mean? It's just hilarious. Like I was just a regular kid and trying my hardest. I wasn't the most skilled guy, but I'd fight anybody. I hit, I'd just do whatever I was told. And people respected that to this day. It's unbelievable how well I get treated in Vancouver. And I was in Vancouver um at stanley park and uh with my kids last year and they were all yelling and or a couple years ago before covid and they're all yelling and kind of like distracting me and i didn't see the speed limit and i got pulled over for, for speeding i got this rental car and my daughter starts recording in the back seat on her ipad <laughs> me getting pulled over and the cop nice. i hand over my license and the cop's like uh Scatcher, Arizona license. You're not like the hockey player, Dave Scatcher, are you? And I'm like, 
actually, sir, yeah, I am. And he goes, oh, man. He goes, you you gave me so many fun nights to cheer about. And he goes, you guys were so good. I thought you were gonna, that team had a chance and never really went far. But he goes, you know what? You made me smile so many days when you played that, like, I, I'd like to make you smile today and let you off with a warning. Nice. And, and, and I'm like, Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I'm like, is there anything I can do for you? He's like, no, just have a great day with your family. You have a lovely little family. He's a super nice guy. And uh, I roll up the window and my daughter who's like 12 at the time. She's like, are you kidding me, dad? <laughs> like, <laughs> nice. cause, cause they never really saw me play very much. They never really knew that side of me, but she thought that was the coolest thing. And, and she had it recorded on the video, but I never, I never shared it because I didn't want the policeman to get in trouble. Yeah, exactly. All right, Dave, let's get into some uh, fan questions. Of course, when I mentioned you were going to come on, I got a bunch of uh, you know follower and, and and fan questions here for you. Uh, oh. Craig wants to know some of the best and worst locker room pranks. Uh, great one was I think I think it was Todd Bertuzzi and Brad and May. I think we're going back and forth a lot one year and it was getting worse and worse. And Maisie, I think had just bought a brand new BMW, like big purchase for him. And uh, he, he, he was really proud of that car. And one of the guys, I think it was Bert went and got tons of popcorn from like the GM plays, like bags, like giant, huge, huge, huge bags. Yeah. And when practice was going on, he, he um, paid one of the trainers to go and unlock Maisie's car. So when he came off the ice, he, could, he didn't have to grab the keys or do anything. And he went and opened up the sunroof and he just poured all these giant, huge bags of buttered popcorn, like in his whole car and filled it up. So like from the, from the wheel, well, like from the, from the brakes and the pedals all the way to the top of the sunroof, it was all popcorn. You couldn't see any seats. You couldn't see anything. It was hilarious. And then, wow. And, and, and Maisie was rattled and he's like, why'd you have to get like buttered stuff? Like, he's like, I can't get this stuff out of my car. I saw some other ones where guys, and this is like minor leagues and stuff, but I saw, um, one guy put a fish in a guy's trunk underneath the little carpet and just like put it back down. And um, the guy was like looking around his car. He couldn't find it anywhere. He couldn't find the smell. He's looking under the seats. He's like losing it. And it got worse and worse and worse oh, as the Lord. season went on. The guys wouldn't even ride with him in his vehicle anymore. He's like, I've looked everywhere. I don't know what's going on. I don't know where the smell's coming from. Basically ruined his car. Yeah. Uh, what did Brad May do to, to Bertuzzi to get him back? Do you know? Oh, because dude, gosh. that's like that's game on. Yeah. No, it got it got really um, the the team had to stop it because it started to get like a little bit like over the top. And I honestly, yeah. I'm trying to think. I mean, I remember a couple times guys dress shoes being drilled into the bench. So like <laughs> you go to lift your dress shoes off of the bench after the game and they're like screwed into the bench. There's a hole right through your $800 Gucci shoes and they're nice. like sitting there. So another one, um, this happened in the minors and it was a roommate. I'm not going to say, but actually if you read the book, you'll know who it is. He took a, <laughs> He took a crap in a box and then froze it in uh, our freezer at our place in the miners and then mailed it with wrapping paper around it in the mail to a fellow friend of ours on another team. So he gets this like birthday gift. <laughs> he goes to open it up and it had thawed, thawed out over those two or three days of shipping. And uh, that was his gift. So, oh I mean, God. I, I could stay here for hours telling like yeah. th there's so many funny things. I, I I've seen rooms be like completely upside down. Like the beds are all upside down, the lamps, desk, the, down, desk, yeah. the lamps, the TV, like everything. I'm like, how do they do that? Like everything is totally upside down. Wow. Um, I've seen beds moved out of the hotel room and in the hallway. So you come back after like late dinner, something is 12 or one o'clock in the morning and you see somebody's in bed the in the middle of the hallway. You're like, what? So oh, that's awesome. I they really do become kind of like 
you know, family, those guys, right? You're oh. hanging with them so much. And you know what? You hang with your your teammates and your trainers more than your own family during a hockey season. Like that's how many hours. Um, for for the most part, especially if you're on like like Vancouver travels quite a bit. Like in Long Island, we 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 had really great travel. We'd go to Jersey and be home. We'd go to the Rangers, we'd be home. We'd go to Washington, we'd be home. Like you'd, you'd sleep in your own bed like twice as much as you would on the West Coast. So it's such a a nice thing. But um, I mean. One last prank that I'm thinking of is we used to cellophane guys toilets. So it would look like there's a toilet bowl, but you go to pee on it and it would just bounce off the, yeah. off the cellophane all over the place. Oh uh, my God. Yeah. The worst. Re- really grown up. Uh, behavior. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> totally right. All right. Rob wants to know, uh, wondering which NHL team had the most, he had the most fun playing on and which NHL cities have the best fan fans and food. Wow. Okay. So funnest times playing were Vancouver and New York. Um, Vancouver, because all my buddies were there. I just love the city. Uh, I live downtown for the most part. Um, I love Vancouver. I think it's one of the most am- amazing cities in the world. Uh, if it didn't rain so much, I would have retired there. Um. Mm-hmm. So I love that. I love the vibe of the city. I love the mountains. I love the ocean. Like it's just perfect for me. Um, and even my, if it didn't rain, my wife would, would live there too. Like we love the summer months. Vancouver just the rains a lot in the winter. Oh, yeah. um, New York, like, even though I didn't live in the city, uh, it was only like a 30, 40 minute drive for us to get downtown Manhattan. And um, I mean, that city is just incredible. Like the food, the, 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 like if you were crazy, like there would be something to do every single day or night there. Like it's, it's, it's the most multicultural, vibrant, alive city probably that I've ever been in in the world. I mean, Japan, when we started this season in Roppongi in Japan, that's kind of like a mini New York city with just tons of buzz around it. But New York City is pretty special. Madison Square Garden is pretty special. Mm. Um, we're there for 9-11, like the energy. It's like a living city. Like, it's just, you can just feel it when you walk in. And um, the food is like, because it's so multicultural. There's just so much good food that you would, it's hard to find anywhere else. So New York City is pretty special. Um there weren't too many bad cities in the NHL. Yeah, really. <laughs> Buffalo was the Buffalo was the one where you'd be like, "Oh man, like, what are we gonna <laughs> do tonight? There's nothing to do." That there'd be one steakhouse in the hotel, so I didn't even see any of. The, I'm sure there's beautiful places in Buffalo, and I apologize to Buffalo listeners, but it's like it was snowy and gray and cold every single time I was ever in Buffalo. So we didn't leave the hotel really. Right, right. Uh, Martin goes uh, during your awesome career. What was your high point that you'll always remember want to talk about? And on the flip side, what's your low point where you thought this is tough and I want out? It's all in the book, guys. You got yep. to read the book. Got that book. Um, let's see. I had, I had two hat tricks in like two weeks or something like that. They're on my wall over there. And yep. um, that was pretty special. One was against the Tampa Bay Lightning, Benito Calpier, Marty St. Louis. And then the other one was against Mario and Jaeger and nice. like I only played like 12 minutes in one game and 13 minutes in another game that's no power play or anything like that that was the year I scored 27 I was up for I think I'm I don't know if I won player of the week or I think I think I'm or sorry player of the month I was up for the running of player of the month in the NHL which for a guy like me that's pretty special because I wasn't a regular occurrence and I didn't really get a ton of ice time so those two hat tricks were like amazing. And that year was amazing with 27 goals. And I love my line with Jason Weimer and Jason Blake. We were just on fire. I think I put in the book that I think after November, we scored the most goals as a third line in the whole league. Uh, yeah. That's Blakey, awesome. Blakey had a great year. Weems had a career year. I had my career year and we were, I don't want to say unstoppable, but we dominated like, it wasn't even close and couldn't believe it. They got rid of Weems next year uh, mm. when Peter Laviolette took over 
And then I went down to the fourth line and I'm like, I just led the team in goals. Like I thought I was getting a promotion. You're like, oh, I thought I was going to maybe make the second line. Like what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, man. It just sucks. And then Weird. I even, I put in the book, I, I regretted myself not going and, and saying something about it. I just kind of accepted it. And like, I've been just trying to hang on to a job my first few years. And then I didn't really give myself enough credit where I could have went in and had some pull and said, you know what? Like nobody scored more goals than me last year. So oh, that's incredible that they like, just put me on the power play and throw me in front of the net. Like I'll bang something in. Yeah. But Lavi had his own guys he loved and um, whatever. It's just weird. Like I, the one thing and uh, Tim Hunter told me this when I was uh, just drafted and Vancouver was having their run in 94 and they were going to the finals and uh, we got to ride shotgun along with them, a bunch of prospects before the, I think before the draft, or maybe it was after the draft. We weren't in the minors and we were just junior players, but Hunts is sitting out a game and I just caught him alone. And I'm like, here I am like this, like 18 year old kid. And I'm just like, Hey, Mr. Hunter, like, I really respect you as a player. Is there anything that you could give me advice on moving forward as a, as a player? Like, what do I need to be doing? What can I do more of? And he said, Dave, I love your question. He said, the only thing that you can ever control in this league is like how hard you work and how great a con your conditioning is. Like if a coach likes you or doesn't like you, there's not a lot you can do about it. If you get drafted, if the scouts like you or they don't like you, there's not a lot you can do about it. Like, but you can show up ready to play in the NHL and be prepared every single day. And that's all you can control and in, in your work ethic. So like I built my career on that, really that advice, because that's, that's what it took. And there were times when I'm sure it was a toss up between the job for me and somebody else. And I truly felt like my work ethic and my conditioning, I always, I always kept me in a good place where I was probably going to win, you know, mm -hmm. if we, if we were fighting for jobs and um, you know, I, I, my skill level developed as I got older, but when I first came in the league, I was really raw. Like when I was with Vancouver, I was really raw. And they told me that. Hmm. So. Interesting. Um, well, that, that, that advice uh, that Hunter gave you almost you know, mimics or mirrors what your dad told you as a kid. Yeah. I hadn't thought about it till now, but you're right. Um, it was very much like that. And as far as the, um, the second part of that question is, you know, what's the, the worst or the darkest spot? I mean, um, there were, there were a lot of times and I put them all in the book where I almost mm -hmm. couldn't handle anymore. Uh, I was really bullied a lot as a kid, like bad by one guy. Uh, he was three years older than me and just beat the crap out of me all the time. Um, I moved away from home to go play junior at 16. And in that league, they allowed unlimited number of 20 year old players on each team. So it wasn't like the BCJ where there's like three allowed or the Western league where there's three guys allowed. Like you could have like eight guys that were 20 years old. So wow. when there's a group of them and there's this young up and comer kid who's kind of taking their ice time or about to take their ice time, they never made it easy on me. And they weren't, they weren't brutal, but they, they weren't nice. And I remember calling home, telling my mom how homesick I was and how much I missed my brother my sister and my friends and my mom's food and positivity. And that was a turning point when I, when I decided to stay and not come home because she told me I'd regret it. Right. Um, something shifted in me where I just said, okay, like I'm all in on this thing. Like there's nothing going to stop me ever. Like I will not be stopped. Like I'm going to outwork everyone. I don't care what they do to me. I don't care how hard the coaches are on me. Like I'm all in. There's nothing that I'm going to stop. I will die on the cross. I will do whatever I have to do to freaking get there. And it's like, I'll out train, out work, outlast every person here. Like that's, I just got pissed and I just said, that's, that's what I'm doing. And literally my life changed that day. And very near after, like five months after that, I was in a, a bag skate with, with the winter Hawks. I put that in the book where I didn't know, but they had coaches secret and GM secretly hidden in the rafters, watching this 
unbelievably difficult bag skate where they were trying to break us. Like they were trying to see who was going to stick it out and who wasn't. And there were like five or six of us on the ice. And there's this turning point where my guys came to me in the lineup and they said, Hey Dave, like slow down, like let's pace ourselves. We're going to be out here for a while. And we'd already been on the ice for like an hour and a half. We're going for probably another 30 minutes. And it was like end to end boards. It was ridiculous. And, uh, the easy thing to do would have just been like, all right, all right, cool. Like, let's just save our legs. Let's just pace ourselves. You know, we won't build a practice tomorrow if we keep going at this pace. That was like the, the, the normal thinking, but then something in my voice, in my brain just said, no, Dave, like you got to go, like, just keep doing you. You just got to do you. And like, who cares if they don't like you? Who cares if you don't fit in with this group? Like, this isn't really your group. Your group is the group that's playing tonight you're not playing tonight. So like just, and I started lapping these guys and I started out skating them and people are throwing up and it's like the hardest skate I ever had in my career. And when it was over, the coach came over to me, the assistant coach, Mike Williamson, he said, Hey, great job. We do have one spot in the lineup and you're playing tonight. Good job. And I was like, what? I'm like, I can't play. I just gave everything I have. My lungs are bleeding right now. Like I'm freaking dying. He goes, don't worry, you're not going to get much ice time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but you just got to go get a few shifts in tonight. And what I didn't know was that all the scouts and all the GMs are all hidden up in the rafters. And I didn't think that they were there. I, I, everyone was long gone as far as we were all concerned. But the, that, that day, they kept two of us and sent like three or four of us home. Mm. And I was one of the guys that they kept. And then I'll be darned if the next year I wasn't the captain of the team that I barely made the year before. So all of these turning points and these like decisions to go all in. And even after my heel surgeries and stuff, like, gosh, that was crazy time too. I had to get four heel surgeries. They kept screwing up the surgeries and I lived at the Rosedale and Robson downtown and I couldn't, I couldn't walk. I crawled to the bathroom to use the bathroom. Uh, I didn't have crutches. I didn't have a wheelchair. And it was the worst. And I was like that for two weeks before I could make my way down to the lobby and get a taxi to GM place and then go sit in the hyperbaric chamber back when that was a new thing. That was like 95 or something. Um, and they used, the Canucks used it for that playoff run. I remember as recovery and everyone made a big deal about it, but that, somehow I made the NHL that year when I couldn't even skate until like August 15th and training camp was like September 10th or something. Like I just feel like mentally I was unbreakable. Like there wasn't really much that anybody could throw at me that I, that I hadn't already seen before that I wasn't willing to overcome. I didn't care about the pain. Like I learned to like turn pain off so long ago that when I was trying to heal years later, I had to rewire the way my brain works so that I could actually heal because I could just mute the pain and turn it off and pretend it didn't exist until it was just too much at the end when my, when my head was destroyed and, and my body was breaking down. And then that's actually when I found this new energy that we now use and I call it the unbound energy of of the universe when you're free and I don't have to wear all the armor and I don't have to turn everything off anymore. And I can actually feel like I could run through this wall right now and not feel a thing. Like this is back in the day. I could run through that wall and not feel a thing. I could go fight anybody. I just like not have any fear. Like it was crazy, but then I couldn't really feel anything. The good stuff either. Cause I was just like this right. armored up, like, guy gladiator type of guy and i'm like now i'm so soft and i'm so <laughs> protected and i like to think of it like i'm cloaked in this beautiful light that's just protecting me now and it's a different way it's a lighter way of being it's not so heavy and um you know that's been it's taken me a decade to figure out but now when i can show other people how to live in that authentic place and not be afraid to feel magic starts to happen and and that, that that goes for like relationships and finances and health like everything starts to click so yeah it's, it's crazy how it all led me to like right now yeah and it's all in the book 
<laughs> right. come back grab the comeback all right dave i, I want to respect your time here uh, i told you i'd be half hour i think we're getting close to about an hour here so i'll ask you a couple more questions we'll kind of get a little bit past hockey and what you're known for um so i'm just curious what, what are you binge watching lately for tv series and stuff oh wow that's a great great question um I don't really watch a ton of TV. Uh, I barely get to watch hockey games. I live in Scottsdale. There's not a lot on the TV. Um, I do some stuff with the Coyotes. We just did an event in El Paso for Hockeyville, El Paso, Texas, if you can believe it. Um, Let's see, binge watch. I love, well, Ozark on Netflix has been a big thing. We used to watch Game of Thrones, obviously. I think like everybody. Yeah. I just started Succession last night because I had three or four friends tell me it's really good. Yeah, dude, you're going to love that. That's great. So we're three episodes into that. Um, man, it's 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 kind of addicting, though, like, <laughs> like when it's so easy just to watch the next show. And I know, and right? I, like, because it's so different from what, because you're, what, 45, I'm 47. So it's, you know, like we're used to that once a week you get one episode and now it's just so easy to it's weird through, like right? think about our kids like like yeah. i remember ordering like a swiss army knife uh, from a from a magazine or a newspaper and i had to wait like six weeks to get it four to six weeks of shipping right yeah and then like now it's amazon prime like my kids order something like a nerf gun or a whatever mm-hmm. and it's like they're instantaneously and then like mcdonald's and netflix and like Everything's just instant gratification. Yeah. Our society has not learned to appreciate the the journey because they don't really need it anymore. It's just like instant. And I think that there's a piece that gets missed out on of that anticipation. Like, you remember those Rambo knives with the compass on the end and the matchsticks in it and stuff? Like, I remember ordering one of those and like, I want to be like Rambo and run (laughs) through the forest and stuff. And like... I use my paper up money to pay for those things. And it's like, when you finally got it, you're like, yes, but you appreciated it more. And um, we literally, totally. had- not, not, it was, not only like that, Dave, but it was also like in all regards, like if you wanted to know about a band, there's no internet. You needed to wait for Rolling Stone spin, you know, you'd have to go to tower records and stand outside tower records. Or I guess, what did they have in, in Vancouver? They had a different one. A and B sound. Yeah. A and B sound. You'd go and you'd anticipate that album. You, you'd, you'd be waiting there to go get it. And, you know, right. like, this is the world that our kids are living in. I had to sit down for a family meeting with my kids the other day. And I just said, guys, like, this is hard for me to parent on because we didn't have the stuff and the things that you guys have now in your face and social media and all this stuff. It's like, it's really difficult to figure out what all is going through in their little minds. Right. And uh, we try to keep our kids as away from electronics and social and stuff as much as we can, but it's Hard. inevitable. It's inevitable. It's kind of like everywhere. Yeah. And um, so I don't know why we're, <laughs> how I got off on this tangent, but my point <laughs> being is, you know, there's no way that I could be, teaching and loving the work that I do now as much as I do if I didn't go through all of the struggles that basically trained me to be at this point in time doing this work with these people and having empathy and compassion and love for them that I would never have had before because it was kind of all about me and my career Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and after struggling to fight through it and figure out a way to survive and to thrive again I learned to appreciate anxiety or fear and understand it intimately because I lived in that world for three years. I lived in the darkness for so long. I was so scared. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to get out of here. And the fact that that was training ground for me to have compassion and, and understanding and empathy that I would never have had if I didn't go through it makes it all perfect again. Like it's always perfect, even when it doesn't feel like it's perfect and it feels like you're going through the worst time, like just keep going. Cause like there's something on the other side of that pain that's going to like be a gift to you. 
Cool. But if I but if I would have accepted the diagnosis from the Mayo Clinic or all these people, and they're like, "Hey, you're just going to have permanent dis- disabilities. You're just not going. You're going to be on Alzheimer's medicine the rest of your life. You're going to get dementia. You're going to get all this. Like, this is the things they're telling me. If I would have accepted that, I would still be there. Well, you wouldn't be where you are today. No, like, no. I, I would. I would absolutely still just be that the concussed guy, the messed up guy, the broken guy. Like I, I could have hung my hat on that and said, you know what? I guess it's just how it ends. I guess it's just how my life's going to be. Okay. And there's something in me that was like screaming at me, going, "No, man, you got to go. Like, go find answers. Go find. Go do the stuff that like nobody else is doing. Go figure out who's healed from this stuff and go partner with them and work with them and figure out like what you got to do to get yourself back on track." And I always felt like I was called for more. I just couldn't figure out how that looked until I had to go and live through hell and then figure out a way to have a healthy, happy life. And um, now, we, now, I mean, not, not that I have it all figured out, but I got a lot of it figured out and I'm able to help other people kind of get through that other side. And uh, it just feels really nice. And I'm grateful for it all. I'm yeah. grateful. I'm grateful for the injuries and, um, it's the best it's thing all, that ever happened to yeah, you. Yeah, it's all uh, made you who you are today. All right, Dave, yes, la- last question. I'll wrap it up with uh, uh, with one about, uh, you know, growing up uh, as a kid. What's the music that your parents are playing in the Scatchard house? Oh, wow. I mean, they had some CCR, Creedence Clearwater Revival. They had Ann Murray. Remember Ann Murray? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Songbird. Rolling Stones. Um, you know, I was like a big Kiss fan. I, I bought my, one of my friends. Is, man. One, one of my friends started to collect uh, Kiss albums, and uh, then I started to. Um, I would. I was probably more musically inclined than both my parents, and I would go and play the record player. There wasn't even. I don't even think there was a tape player. But well, we didn't. I don't know if we we had records. I remember that, and I remember yeah, putting them on when I was little and just like sitting there for hours listening like just to staring at the album covers and like looking yeah. at the back and fl- if there was a flip open flipping that open and like yeah i mean uh led zeppelin um who else was uh i was just listening to uh leonard skinner um you know i'm trying to think of what my folks had they they really only had about like 20 or 30 albums i'm just going like a rotation you know right. what i mean Funny story about music is uh, like, I remember when Bon Jovi and uh, Brian Adams and all these guys were coming out and like disc, disc mins. Uh, I put this in the book too. I got my first disc min and I remember like, I'm like, Oh, this would be amazing. The sound quality is so much better than tape. And then I'm like, I used to listen to music on my Walkman, Sony Walkman when I'd run through the forest and train. And so this is a young boy, like imagine an 11 year old boy or 12 year old boy running with, I was holding like a pizza server, like, like, <laughs> like a waiter. And I was holding my disc because it would skip if I held it any other way. So I had to right. run with one arm up, like jumping over logs and going down into the river. <laughs> like I'm holding this stupid disc man. And I would do that for, for probably a couple months. And I'm like, ah, I just got to go back to the walk. I mean, it was too hard to like run with, but I, I wanted to listen to it on the disc man so bad. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> That's so good. What was your first concert? Uh, Beach Boys in uh, the Beach Boys. We're doing this uh, reunion tour type of thing in Kelowna. And we were in Salmon Arm and we drove over to Kelowna. And I just remember these old guys on stage and they had the hottest uh, backup singers and the hottest like dancers in bikinis. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. what are you, is this what being a rock star is? <laughs> Cause it's like crazy. Yeah. And I was just little, but like, I couldn't help but notice what was running around on the stage. And I was just like, wow. Um, some of my favorite concerts, uh, were, uh, Dr. Dre and Eminem at, uh, GM place. Um, that was really cool. And then I remember going over to bar none after the concert and Snoop, Snoop was there, Snoop Dogg. Nice. And I and I used to sit in this one little area of Bar None and they called it like the library. And it had these fake books and stuff and these leather couches. And it was kind of like just loungy and a little private. And uh, the bouncers all there knew me. And they're like, hey, Sketch, what's up? I'm like, nothing. I go wander back to my seat. <laughs> I got a reservation there. And they're like, uh, somebody's, somebody's in your seat, but mm-hmm. we'll introduce you. And it was Snoop Dogg. 
And that was the first time I met Snoop twice in my career, but um, that was the first time. And he offered for me to, to sit down and have a drink with him and his crew. So nice. I did. And then uh, I felt uncomfortable. I was kind of by myself and I had a couple of teammates coming. So we, I ended up moving over after, but uh, yeah, that was a great concert. Um, Kiss and Aerosmith in Las Vegas. That was amazing. We thought we had crappy seats and then we actually had the best seats in the house because we were right at the end of the runway that runs out into the center of the crowd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Steven Tyler looks over at my wife and looks back at me and gives me a wink like, hey, <laughs> good job, overachiever. Nice. <laughs> so I love music. It's uh, it's I have music going all the time. I had a yeah. guy this morning. It Same. pumps me up. It's like the soundtrack to my life. And uh you know, there's lots of stories about the Nickelback boys in there uh, during our, our our crazy careers were kind of taken off simultaneously and they ended up coming out onto the ice and skating with us in Phoenix and in Long Island. And I had the whole tour over to my house. We cooked up about 50 steaks for all the all the, you know, drummers, and all the drum techs and guitar techs and the, the band and partied all night there. And um, awesome. Yeah. But anyways, I, I know you got a timeline, um, but I, I just appreciate you having me on. And, uh, you know, like I said, I'll send you a couple of links for um, the book and also our live event that I think would be really fun for people to come down to. And we'll, we'll save you 700 bucks on that. We'll give you an early bird discount ticket on that. Nice. Man. And, and um, yeah, man, keep doing what you're doing. Well, thank you, Dave, for, uh, for taking the time here and, and, and joining us. You're easy you to find online. Uh, it's simply just your name on uh, on both Twitter and Instagram. Yeah, uh, we've got allstarcoaching.com. Um, just going to mention that as well. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, I don't know, there's something in there for everybody. There's, there's a lot of cool things that we have going on now and upcoming, as I mentioned earlier about the hockey stuff. Uh, up until this point, I've kind of kept my coaching, my business and life coaching, project separated from my hockey life but i think they're going to kind of start to join each other as i launch this other hockey uh, entertainment pieces and documentary that kind of like will draw it all together which is cool for people because they can kind of kind of see how it all links the worlds are colliding it's a wild man yeah it's, it's very cool awesome yeah. dave have a great day man i appreciate you taking some time and uh, we'll tag in when we're throwing the stuff around online. I'll watch for those links to share with our followers as well. And uh, I guess we'll see you soon. Yeah, hopefully see everybody up in Vancouver. I hope you guys are staying safe and healthy. And uh, God bless each and every one of you. I hope you have an amazing end to your 2021 and an amazing uh, bounce back for 2022 for everyone. The Todd Cast Podcast on ToddHancock.ca. What's up, everyone? It's Noah Daniels. Hey, y'all. I'm JJ. Hey, guys. It's Kat. And we're your host of the Real Hauntings Podcast. We bring on guests who share their firsthand encounter ghost stories and supernatural experiences. Now on to the trailer. I've been warned to not tell this story, but I think because of the way it ends, it's okay to tell this story because some people say that with certain entities to like speak of them or talk about them or in any way like portray them as powerful will attract them to other people. The creepiest thing about it to me is a lot of times it would wait for me to notice it. Like it would just lay its arm out like this and then I'd be like, where is it? Where is it? And then I'd see it and then it would just slither back. For more information on the Real Hauntings, Real Ghost Stories podcast, make sure you check out real.fm to learn more about our podcast and many other amazing podcasts. Hi, I'm Jennifer, a founder of the Go Kid Go Network. At Go Kid Go, putting kids first is at the heart of every show that we produce. That's why we're so excited to introduce a brand new show to our network called The Search for the Silver Lining, a fantasy adventure series about a spirited young girl named Isla who time travels to the mythical land of Camelot. Look for The Search for the Silver Lining on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. 
Hey, hey, are you ready for some real talk and some fantastic laughs? Join me, Megan Rinks. And me, Melissa DeMonts, for Don't Play Me, But Am I Wrong? We're serving up four hilarious shows every week designed to entertain and engage and, you know, possibly enrage you. And Don't Blame Me, we dive deep into listeners' questions, offering advice that's funny, relatable, and real. Whether you're dealing with relationship drama or you just need a friend's perspective, we've got you. Then switch gears with But Am I Wrong, which is for listeners who didn't take our advice and want to know if they are the villains in the situation. Plus, we share our hot takes on current events and present situations that we might even be wrong in our lives. Spoiler alert, we are actually quite literally never wrong. But wait, there's more. Check out See You Next Tuesday, where we reveal the juicy results from our listener polls from But Am I Wrong? And don't miss Fisting Friday, where we catch up, chat about pop culture, TV, and movies. It's the perfect way to kick off your weekend. So if you're looking for a podcast that feels like a chat with your besties, listen to Don't Blame Me, But Am I Wrong? on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes every Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday.